should start. So we want to thank you all for coming. Uh, this is the first uh, lecture in the um, uh, lab series for the spring 2016. So I'd like to make a few thank yous to the Dean of Critical Studies of Anna Beach and uh, to the uh, director of, uh, of the uh, program, uh, Anna de Goubert. I'm actually the interim director this semester. My name is James Wilchin. Uh, and so I think uh, it's with uh, not too much introduction, but a very brief one, I'd like to introduce um, our esteemed uh, speaker for tonight, uh, Stephen Shapiro. Many of you know his work. Um, uh, and I'm just going to read a blurb off of one of his new books, The Universe of Things on Speculative Realism. He also has a book after that called No Speed Limit. Three essays on accelerationism. And he'll also talk about his new book, so he's been busy. So let me read this very quickly. He's the Delroy uh, Professor of English at Wayne State University. Um, uh, he authored several books, and I won't go through those because I already have. Certainly, has gone through um, uh, uh, and a, and an expert in many ways on to lose, as well as um, uh, I did. So uh, tonight, we're going to be treating <coughs> his new book. Or, excerpts from that in terms of science fiction. So, without any more than my fanfare, Stephen Shaviro. Thanks. <laughs> okay, so, can you hear me this way? Because the reprogression is kind of weird. If I go like this. Okay, is this better? Yeah, that's better for me. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, so what I thought I'd do in, it was, um, I've been told I can go whatever I want, but I won't go into Trump conspiracy theories or anything like that. So. <laughs> no. Is this better? How's this? Okay, sounds good. Okay, so um, what I really thought I could do for this occasion was um, I have a new book coming out in about two weeks. And because my publisher is in the UK and I can't make it to London, and they weren't able to arrange anything like a book launch. They told me if I went to London, they arrange book launch, but I'm too busy. And too expensive, so I, but I was invited here instead, so I thought I could use this occasion to be naked as a sort of a book launch. So I'm going to talk mostly about and read some passages from my new book. So my new book, I have a copy, you can't buy, not that on stores yet. Amazon says I'll have it at, on March 1st. Um, the book is called Discognition. It's published by a new press, Repeater Books. Repeater Books is founded by the people who were behind Zero Books, which started in 2009-2010, which has published some of the most interesting work in politics, in, in theory, in art, in various areas. And there was a falling out between the people who originally had Zero Books and the publisher of the parent corporation, so they left and found a new press, Repeater. And I'm happy to be with only the third book they published since they started. Um, it actually is, so their, their first book is, the first book they published is, um, is called Lean Out by Dawn Forster, who's a British feminist journalist, and it's a response to the infamous lean in, or it could be kind of yuppie feminism guide to how to be a CEO, even if you're female. And it's, I actually saw a copy at, and I'm saying most at least, and there's a really good bookstore there, I'm not forgetting that actually had a copy, so maybe I'll copy mine, mine when it finally comes in. But anyway, okay. So my book is called Discognition, which is a made up word. Um, they used to have a subtitle, and the subtitle was removed from the book, but it, was, it survived as the title of this official title of this lecture Fictions and Fabulations of Consciousness. So I'll try to describe what I'm doing in the book overall, and I'll read the introduction, and then maybe make some more comments and then maybe read some more from the book, but okay. So, the book is about philosophical questions having to do with things like consciousness 
cognition, sentience. There are a number of words which are not quite synonymous, but are semi-synonymous or overlapping, which people use. And part of the reason is, is that nobody has any idea about any of these terms or what they really mean. Um, I started out by reading a lot of philosophy. The consciousness studies has been a very active topic in the philosophy of mind in the last 20 or 25 years. And what you get from reading the philosophers who write about this is that um, there are, a lot of them are really brilliant, they make really compelling arguments, and there are as many positions, at least, as there are people. Some of them said more positions than there are people, because nobody agrees with anybody else about even square one of what it means to talk about consciousness or mentality or thought or any of, or any of these terms. And I say even more than one, because some people have changed their position radically over the years. So the, the philosophic reading was very informative and interesting, but it sort of left me in a dead end. And this is where I really thought of turning to science fiction, which is a strategy which I increasingly uh, recommend for a lot of things. Um, science fiction is a form of speculate, of informed speculation and extrapolation. And it's a way of doing a kind of thought experiment, which is something that scientists and philosophers themselves also do, but it's being done in a different way when it's science fiction, because you sort of have to do the thought experiment, but also tell a story with interesting characters which can hook the reader in some way emotionally. And that might seem to lead to, from a philosophical point of view, to lead to a loss of rigor. But I think, um, actually, it is, is a way of thinking about problems which is different from others and which may have strengths which others don't have. What, a fi what fiction does, it takes up a problem, but since it's embodying the problem in a narrative of characters, it has to be performative in some way, and this sort of goes helps to guard against problems of excessive distraction, let's say. Um, it's, it's also by speculative, it's not bound, it's, it, it's bound by certain rules, there are certain things you have to say or can say, you can't just, I mean, you can, when you're writing a work of fiction, invent just anything, but if it seems totally arbitrary, nobody's going to read it, probably. Um, and it's actually harder than you think. I think there have been avant-garde experiments to try to write prose in which every sentence is disconnected for every other sentence, but it's actually one of the hardest things in the world to try to do something like that. It's very hard to avoid continuity and narrative and things like that. So I admire people who try, but I don't usually like to read the results. But anyway, um, so I've done this before. A lot of my past work has been about science fiction, and it's about science fiction as a way of thinking through different issues. And there are a lot of different ways to do this. I mean, our science fiction deals with a lot of different things. Some science fiction deals with straight technological issues, obviously, um, since science fiction is usually set in the future with an extra extrapolated technology from the one we actually have now. Um, but science fiction can also very often deal with philosophical questions like ontological questions. And science fiction also very often deals with social, political, and economic questions which has been inspiring this, the large amount of dystopian fiction in the past 20 years, um, much of which is science fictional, is a way to kind of try to think ourselves out of the neoliberal dilemma that we're in. So I can try to talk more on that. This book, I sort of suspended some of the early concerns to try to focus more narrowly on these philosophical problems about thought, about consciousness, about sentience, and so on and so forth. Um, so, I'll come back, I'm gonna, what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to read the introduction to the book, which sort of sets up what I'm trying to do. Then I'll describe a little bit about the book in, in general. And then after that, I'll bring back to some thoughts about, you know, what I'm saying might be true about imaginative work or in, in, you know, literature, art, whatever, more generally. So I'll, after I read this, I'll try to say something very specific about what it is about science fiction, which seems to me to do these things. Of course, it's an idealization in the sense that I think all genres and all category distinctions tend to be fuzzy around the edges, as Wittgenstein recognized. And they're never rigorous. They're always exceptions or counterexamples. But that doesn't mean they aren't useful if, if deployed in the right way, which I hope is what I'm doing. So anyway, I'm going to start by basically most of the introduction to the book. Okay. What is consciousness? How does subjective experience occur? Which entities are conscious? Or to put things as particularly as possible, what is it like to be a bat, as Thomas Nagel famously asked? For that matter, what is it like to be a dog, a robot, or a tree, or even a human being? 
Is it like anything at all to be a rock or a star or a neutrino? How do we explain the very fact of being aware? What does it really mean to be conscious, to think, to feel, or to know? And what is the difference, if any, between thinking, feeling, being aware, and knowing? Such questions might seem to have obvious answers until we actually try to answer them. Then we can discover that we don't have a clue and that these questions have never come close to being plausibly answered. Still today, there is no consensus whatsoever upon any of these topics, topics, neither among scientists and philosophers, nor among the general public. We are clearly sentient, and we, yet we do not know what sentience is, how it can exist, or what it means. Whenever I come across such intractable problems, my impulse is always to turn to science fiction. Perhaps we'll be able to imagine what we are unable to know. Science fiction is a special kind of literature, or better, a special kind of power literature, as Samuel Delaney calls it, that operates through speculation and extrapolation, and that takes place conceptually, if not grammatically, in the future tense. It is a kind of thought experiment, a way of entertaining odd ideas of asking off-the-wall what-if questions. But instead of approaching each issues abstractly, as philosophy does, or breaking them down into empirically testable propositions, as physical science does, science fiction embodies these issues in characters and narratives. By telling stories, it asks questions about all sorts of things. Consciousness and cognition, the future, extreme possibilities, non-human otherness, and especially the deep consequences, the powers and limitations of both our ideologies and our technologies. The method of science fiction is emotional and situational rather than rational and universalizing. Philosophical argumentation and scientific experimentation both endeavor to prove and to ground their assertions, however counterintuitive these may seem to be at first glance. Science fiction also proposes counterintuitive scenarios. But its effort is rather to work through the weirdest and most extreme ramifications of these scenarios and imagine what it would be like if they were true. Where philosophy is foundational, science fiction is pragmatic and exploratory. And where physical science seeks to settle upon predictable and repeatable results, science fiction seeks to unsettle and singularize these results and to provide us with unrepeatable histories. Science fiction does not ever actually prove anything but its scenarios may well suggest new lines of inquiry that analytic reasoning and inductive generalization would never stumble upon by themselves. In this cognition, I look at a series of science fiction narratives in order to raise questions about consciousness and thought, or better, about sentience. I prefer this latter term because it does not presuppose that mental processes and experiences are rational, nor even that they are necessarily conscious. When certain philosophers elevate human sapience over mere animal sentience, which is a tendency we see, I think it's most famously associated with the philosopher Robert Brandom at the University of Pittsburgh, it's been taken up very strongly by some of the more rationalistic of the speculative realist philosophers, notably by Ray Brassier, who's coming here in this series when, a couple months? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, for in fact, I think there's far more of an evolutionary continuity than a sharp distinction between the way that my dog thinks and the way that I think. I have many unique qualities of mind that can never hope that a dog that my dog can never hope to possess. But the inverse of this is also true. Understanding <coughs> intelligence, which Robert Brandon lists as the characteristics of mere sapiens, are in fact deeply rooted in such features of sentience as sensory awareness, reality testing, irritability, and arousal. The difference I maintain is one of degree rather than one of kind. Brandon is therefore wrong, I think, to scornfully dismiss what he calls the merely sentient condition of animals. My dog may not be able to offer and inquire after reasons, as Wilfred Sellers and Brandon would wish, just as my dog cannot figure out how to extricate himself when he gets tangled up in his leash. Nonetheless, he exhibits a wide range of moods and feelings. He's quite good at posing and pursuing many sorts of complicated goals, and he's highly skilled at experiencing his, as expressing his desires in ways that I am unable to, that I am able to understand and at comprehending and responding flexibly to my own moods and desires. Thinking is a far more common and widely distributed process that we are sometimes willing to recognize. I should mention, this just happened, I just realized this just happened the last week or two. My, my dog has learned, my dog really hates when I go out and leave him at home. And he's learned to recognize when I pronounce the letters CVS, he immediately goes over and starts barking and jumping over me and he's very angry. And he's learned that when I talk about going, I talk about CVS, that means I'm going to go out because I'm going to the store. 
So, I mean, it's amazing. I say to my kids, I'm going to go to CVS, but I don't need you to get you anything. And he immediately goes berserk. I think that's, you know, I think that's an important feat, even if he can't figure out how to extricate himself from his leash. <laughs> okay. Um, the narratives that I discuss in this book offer speculation, fictions and fabulations about sentience. There is something oddly recursive about this, since sentience itself is arguably a matter of generating, or of being able to generate, fictions and fabulations. We ought to resist the all too common equation of sentience with cognition. We often find this assumption that sentience equals cognition taken for granted in contemporary philosophy of mind as well as in neurobiological research. But mental functioning and subjective experience need not themselves be cognitive, even though cognition seems impossible without them. Sentience, whether in human beings and animals and other sorts of organisms or in artificial entities, is less a matter of cognition than it is one of what I have ventured to call, in, this, in the term I meant in this book, discognition. I use this neologism to designate something that disrupts cognition, exceeds the limits of cognition, but also subtends cognition. My working assumption is that fictions and fabulations are basic modes of sentience, and that cognition per se is derived from them and cannot exist without them. Fictions and fabulations are often contrasted or opposed to scientific methods of understanding the world. But in fact, there were powerful resonances between them. They are both processes of speculative extrapolation. In other words, constructing and testing scientific hypotheses is not entirely different from constructing fictions and fabulations, and then testing to see whether they work or not, and what consequences follow from them. For science, it's far more than just a passive process of discovery or compiling of facts that are simply out there. Rather, science must actively approach things and processes in the world. This is the reason for making hypotheses. Science needs to solicit and elicit phenomena that would not disclose themselves to us otherwise. It must somehow compel these phenomena to respond to our questions by giving us full and consistent answers. Uh, I'm drawing here on Bruno Latour, and less familiar, but probably more importantly, on the Belgian philosopher of science, Isabel Stengers, who's written a lot about scientific practice in these terms. Anyway. All this kind of, all this process is necessary precisely because things in the world are not cut to our measure. They have no reason to conform to our presuppositions or to fit in any categories that we seek to impose. So again, this relates to my interest in speculative realism, which I've written about elsewhere, where the speculative realists were conscious that the world is consistent because it fits to our mental categories. I think what speculative realism in its various varieties, as well as other recent forms of thought, such as the critical reason of the late Roy Bhaskar is saying is that it's precisely the opposite. It's precisely because the world doesn't have any reason to conform to our desires and to our measures, that these kinds of processes are necessary in order to make contact with it. The modern empirical scientific method is sometimes described as a process of torturing nature to reveal her secrets. A phrase often attributed to Francis Bacon, but when I was trying to search it online, it seemed to say that Though this has been attributed to Bacon, Bacon never actually said it, and nobody knows really where it came from. But anyway, philosophers of science also like to quote Isaac Newton's phrase, hypothesis non fingo, I, I feign no hypotheses. But a much better account of actual scientific practice is the one proposed by Latour and Sengers, who say that scientists work by negotiating with non-human entities and by entering into alliances with them. Scientists do, not, scientists do not get very far by treating the things they are interested in as mute and inert objects to be dissected. They do much better when they are somehow able to collaborate with the very entities that they seek to observe and explain. Alfred North Whitehead, the philosopher who is a major inspiration for both Latour and Stengers, notes that, and this is a quote from Whitehead, if the rigid Baconian method of induction had been consistently pursued, it would have left science where it found it. In other words, Whitehead says, strict it, strict empirical procedure would have meant that nothing new would ever have been discovered. The came, same can be said for Newton's claim of making no hypotheses. Whitehead insists that science needs not just empirical observation and induction, but also, the, another quote, the play of a free imagination controlled by the requirements of coherence and logic, unquote. That is to say, a certain degree of speculation is always necessary in scientific research. The speculation has to be controlled in some manner. It cannot be altogether arbitrary and unbounded. But without speculation, science is caught in a rut. 
cannot stretch beyond the given immediate facts in order to provide a plausible explanation for those facts. The speculative process described by Whitehead is roughly similar to what Charles Sanders Peirce calls abduction, as opposed to either deduction or induction. For Peirce, abduction stands in contrast to and supplements both deduction and induction. Deduction starts with conditions that are already given and traces out a chain of logical consequences for these conditions. Induction, for its part, generalizes on the basis of an already given set of particular observations. According to Peirce, neither deduction nor induction can actually suggest anything new. Abduction, in contrast, makes a sort of leap into novelty. It shifts register, suggesting a higher order explanation for the circumstances with which it is concerned, or positing a possible cause for the effects in view. Science is often praised for having, as other human disciplines do not, an intrinsic self-correcting mechanism. But without first engaging in abduction or speculation, science would never come up with any material to confirm or deny or to self-correct in the first place. Because it requires flights of speculation, as well as because it requires collaboration among many separate entities, science can never be purely human nor purely rational. This is why efforts to place science on a pedestal, radically separating from other forms of thought and endeavor, are so deeply mistaken. Empirical science and rational discourse are largely continuous with other ways of feeling, understanding, and engaging with the world. These include art, myth, religion, and narrative, together with the non-human modes of inference exhibited by other sorts of organisms. We should therefore always be alert to the deep biological roots of scientific experimentation and discovery. As a neurobiologist Bjorn Brems points out, there has recently been a major change of paradigm in neuroscience. Brems calls it a dramatic shift of perspective from input-output to output-input. We can no longer be satisfied with the old stimulus-response model according to which animals and other organisms passively respond to prior incoming stimuli and learns by means of conditioning or associations among these stimuli. But this is only one part of the story. In addition, and much more importantly, Brad says, biological entities are active reality testers. They are always busy, and here another quote, probing the environment with ongoing variable actions first and evaluating sensory feedback later, i.e. it's the inverse of stimulus response. Rather than just responding to stimuli, they exhibit ongoing activity that is self-generated and only secondarily modulated by stimuli. Output tends to come before input. Organisms engage with their surroundings with spontaneous actions, rather than just waiting for and responding to sensory inputs. For instance, fruit flies, the special focus of Brems' own research, only have tiny brains, but they actively compare the actual results of their reality testing with what can only be called their prior expectations. They also engage in spontaneous, non-deterministic, and unpredictable actions, so that their behavior, Brett says, is notoriously variable even under identical sensory conditions. The same applies not just to animals with neurons and brains, but also to non-animal forms of life, like trees, bacteria, and slime molds. That is to say, living organisms are con continually engaged in their own particular ways in processes of speculative extrapolation and experimentation. When scientists perform experiments and develop theories, actively soliciting responses from the world, they are fundamentally doing the same thing as fruit flies and slime molds, albeit on a far more sophisticated matter and on a more reflexive metal level. Among human beings, speculative extrapolation is not only the method of science. It is also what art in general does and what science fiction does in particular. And here I quote the philosopher Eric Schwitzgabel, who says, Increasingly, I think the greatest science fiction writers are also philosophers. Exploring the limits of technological possibility inevitably involves confronting the central issues of metaphysics, epistemology, and human value." End of quote. In this book, I seek to explore the potentials and implications of sentience by turning to fictions and fabulations, and in particular to written science fiction narratives. I explain texts that are set mostly in the near future, and trace out the potential implications of already existing technologies and research programs in the science and philosophy of mind. Some of these stories can be described as reductionist and eliminativist in the sense that they seek to demystify and discredit our common sense assumptions about how our minds work. Others might be described as expansive in that they seek to show that phenomenal consciousness is irreducible and more widely spread than we sometimes imagine. Some of the narratives deal with human intelligence and consciousness in particular. Others propose radically alien sorts of mentality. In all cases, I seek to follow and extrapolate from the suggestions expressed by the narratives themselves, rather than viewing them with suspicion or working to critique them. More specifically, the hypothesis or speculative wager behind this book 
is that science fiction narratives could help us step beyond the overly limited cognitivist assumptions of recent research, both in the philosophy of mind and in the science of neurobiology. This is because narrative fictions nearly always extend beyond cognition. They're about connecting how and what we know to how we feel and to how we might act to what is it like, Nagel's question in short. Even though his reductionist science fiction stories still work, not just to explain, but also to entangle us within their grim scenarios. In this sense, works of art are forms of or occasions for rehearsal, as the great literary critic Boris Peckham argued long ago. With their extrapolations, these fictions allow us to respond vicariously to situations that might be extremely <coughs> dangerous and painful where they actually do exist. I mean, one of the things I always say to my students when I teach film studies is that I try to explain why it is that I and many other people love horror films, even though I can't think of any things I'd rather, less rather do than be in a room with us, chains of willing maniacs and starting to disembowel me, okay? There's a difference between liking to see that on screen and not wanting to have it happen to you in real life. Okay, that's really what I'm talking about. Art readies us for evaluation and action under conditions of uncertainty. In the aesthetic register, Morse Peckham says, responses are redundantly maintained in situations in which nothing is at stake. This is precisely what allows narrative and other forms of art to explore extreme possibilities. Psychoanalysis and cognitive science both tell us, albeit for vastly different reasons, that consciousness is only a very narrow and specialized part of mental activity. Most thinking takes place non-consciously, outside of our attention or awareness. Even more of our thinking slips away, it cannot be retained in memory or in the form of concepts. Fictions and tabulations can provide us with a sort of feed forward, to use a phrase from the media critic Mark Hansen, a feed forward of those mental processes that are not available to introspection. Hansen emphasizes the quite science fictional way that computational microsensors are now able, and this is a quote from Hansen, microsensors are now able to stand in for consciousness, take the place of sense perception and the operations of registering sensory data. Things beneath or beyond the reach of phenomenal perception are thus made accessible to us, albeit relatedly and indirectly. I want to suggest that fictions and fabulations, whether articulated by human beings or by other entities, are also forms of indirect, non-phenomenological access to non-conscious forms of sentience. Through fictions and fabulations, we learn that there is more to thought than consciousness. But there is also more to thought than the non-conscious computations of which cognitive science speaks. Before it is cognitive, let alone conscious, thought is primordially an affective and aesthetic phenomenon. This is best grasped as a process of what Alfred Ruff White calls feeling. White uses this word feeling, he says, as a mere technical term in order to designate, and here's a quote from Whitehead's very dense vocabulary, that functioning through which the concrete actuality appropriates the data so as to make it its own. Okay, I, I, we don't have the time to spend an hour you know, of an exercise on explaining why it's vocabulary. That would be rewarding, um, very devoted to it. But anyway, but what this means in more familiar language is that every entity becomes what it is by appropriating what is left behind by other entities that precede it. Most crucially, an entity perpetuates itself by appropriating its own prior states of existence. Whitehead says basically I'm a new person every half second, let's say, but there's continuity because who I am this half second really is based on my appropriation of what I was a half second ago. There's a kind of continuity or I take up what came before. But an entity also appropriates other entities in its surroundings. It picks up whatever it encounters, whatever affects it or provides conditions or resources for its own continued existence. This includes perception, but it's not reducible to perception. Um, why do the example of light? If you're not blind, you see a certain wavelengths of light, and we respond to these sensations, we perceive them. Presumably you can't perceive ultraviolet light, but you might say our bodies do perceive ultraviolet light, because when I sit out in the sun and then I get a sunburn, that's been my body perceiving the ultraviolet light. If I develop skin cancer, that's even more of my body's been perceiving the ultraviolet light, even though I didn't consciously perceive it with my eyes. So, perception is only a subset of feeling things, which is anything that affects you means you're feeling it. This primordial act like of feeling or appropriation happens before I know it, and often without my ever becoming aware of it. I can breathe without having to know anything about oxygen. Feeling, as Whitehead describes, it comes about prior to anything like understanding in the Kantian sense, or cognition in the current psychological and analytic philosophical sense, or intentionality in the phenomenological sense. Rather, Whiteheadian feeling is closer to Spinoza's notion of affection, affectio, and to Williams, William James's theory of emotion. James famously says that 
I, I'm, I don't run away because I'm scared. I'm, I'm scared because I find my bike testing up and I'm getting ready to run away, basically. In binary response proceeds, it doesn't require intellectual apprehension. In other words, feeling is something that happens without or before concepts. Modern philosophy is generally uncomfortable about this prospect. Think, for instance, of Kant's famous dictum that thoughts without content are empty, intuitions without concepts are blind. Of Maurice Merleau Ponty's insistence that unreflective experience must itself be reflected upon, and that such reflection cannot be unaware of itself as an event. And of Wilfred Sellers' attack on the myth of the All these philosophers insist that there is no such thing as raw, unmediated experience. Our perceptions and emotions are always already conceptualized. Of course, these arguments are in their own terms impregnable. If I want to insist upon a feeling that is prior to these modes of conceptualization and self-reflection, then I cannot coherently go on to conceptualize it. I cannot assume its solidity as an idea or as a point of presence. I must regard feelings and characterize them before they are conceptualized as fugitive and ungraspable, and perhaps also as non-functional or even dysfunctional. This means, in Kantian terms, that feeling is a matter for aesthetics rather than for empirical understanding. Despite his strictures against intuitions without concepts, by intuitions, Kant means like sense impressions. In the first critique, Kant nonetheless writes the opposite of the third critique, where he talks of aesthetic ideas which he defines as inner intuitions that are so powerful that no concept can be fully adequate to them. In phenomenological terms, we may say that feeling comes before and falls short of any sort of phenomenological intentionality, or even of Merleau-Ponty's reversibility. In cognitivist times, terms, finally, feeling is something to do with what the cognitivist philosopher Thomas Metzinger calls Raffman quality. A sensation of this sort is, and this is a quote from Metzinger, available for attention and online motor control, but is not available for cognition. The evaded cognitive access in principle is not conceptual content. And Metzinger writes about, he calls him Raffman quality, he's writing about Diane Raffman is another philosopher who recorded these experiments where people were shown like two shades of red which are very, very slightly different from each other, and they can tell that they're different looking at them. And if like five minutes later you show somebody a, a slide and said, which of the two slide, which of the two shades of red was this, they're unable to say. They literally can't conceptualize the difference between the two shades of red, which are very close, though they could feel the difference when they saw it. But they can't they it's not that they can't remember it, so they cannot conceptualize it anyway. If they see all the two things again, they see the difference, but if you only see one of them, they cannot say which one it was, or if it was one of the ones or a slightly different one. So there's kinds of experience which evade cognition. In his recent book, Plant Thinking, the philosopher Michael Martyr credits plants with, quote, non-conscious intentionality. He means intentionality here in a phenomenological sense, the idea that thought is, any thought is a thought of or about something. In this book, I argue pretty much the reverse of Martyr, that living organisms beyond beneath their cognitive accomplishments exhibit something like non-intentional sentience. Beneath intentionality, a thought directed to an object, a thought which is about something, or before thought is about anything, there is a thinking process, and it thinks, that is non-transitive, without an object. When it thinks, it feels something, but it does not have any conception of representing of what it is that it feels. As Michael Moore directly points out, plants do not have anything like a unified or centered self. There is no I, first person I to a plant, no subject. But for this very reason, there is nothing, as far as a plant is concerned, like an intentional object either. My formulation is not an absolute reversal of Martyr's formulation, because they do not equate sentience with consciousness. I think that Whitehead is right to speaking of the relative rarity of consciousness, and suggesting that most occasions of feeling, either in ourselves or other entities, are not conscious. Plants are indeed sentient, as recent research has convincingly shown, but this does not necessarily mean that plants are conscious. Plants feel a whitehead sense. They encounter the world and respond flexibly to it. But they do not do so in the same manner with which we are acquainted. So I would argue, I mean, basically that a tree has some like feelings, but it's unlikely, I wouldn't argue that a tree can feel humiliated or angry, because those are not the kinds of feelings that, you know, correspond to what it experiences in a tree. Anyway, in this, in this cognition, in this book, I look at science fiction narratives, fictions and fabulations that consider unusual forms of sentience, both in human beings and in other entities. And I, keep, I list the chapters, I'll just, I won't read here, I'll just say what the chapters are. I have a chapter, the first chapter talks about 
analytic philosophy as theorization of consciousness. And the way in which analytic philosophers find themselves drawn to tell stories, which are thought experiments, which are sort of fictional, counterfactual speculations about how things like perception and consciousness work. And they take these stories, but as I said, they often they disagree entirely with each other, so there's no consensus on how you interpret the stories. I then move on to five chapters about science fictional texts. I'll just, I'll just list them briefly. The first chapter, the first one is about a short story by Maureen McHugh, who's a science fiction writer here in Los Angeles. The story is called The Kingdom of the Blind. And it's about a woman who works in an infotech company for a boring expert system which regulates things like turning on the electricity at the right points in hospitals and things like that. And it seems to become sentient. And she can't prove it's sentient because there's no way to communicate with it. So if it's in a sentience, it's a very alien form of one. The story is a lot about what it needs to conceive and how we could possibly communicate with the limits of doing this. So it's about recognizing something which does seem to have sentience to be thinking and yet, and yet being unable to find common ground with it. The next chapter looks at a novella by Ted Chang called A Life Cycle of Software Objects. And Chang sort of takes, extrapolates from stuff we have now like Siri and other bots which speak and answer us to a point where there would actually be complex enough that we could actually say that they have internal feelings that they actually are thinking, they're not just doing very sophisticated rote responses. And he then sort of examines what what would the nature of these things be? What would our relationship should be? How would we can relate to them? How their existence would be constrained by the something, things like how the software industry works, how it's financed, as well as by theoretical concerns with, and with, with how this might work, how it might be programmed, and ethical concerns, like if these beings are actually sentient, even though they're just software code, what responsibilities do we have to, do we have to them? Okay. The chapter after that is about Scott Baker's Science fiction novel *Neuropath*, which is a which is a which is a horrifically negative novel, which takes basically the premise that um, basically in the novel the CIA has been able to find a way to basically totally manipulate our minds so that they can make us think and feel whatever they want us to think or feel. And a rogue <laughs> neurosurgeon leaves the CIA and starts kidnapping people and torturing them with hideous experiments to demonstrate to the world that humans have no free will and no and our self-consciousness is is completely illusory. The next book after that, I talk about a short story called Wild Minds by Michael Swanwick, a very short story which looks at a future, a near future, in which they discover the devil to optimize human thought and to make us so we have no, no doubts, no illusions about ourselves, no emotional blockages, and everything in our thought process optimized, which basically makes people into super yuppies. And the story is about a man who is revolted by this even though, you know, he's getting ahead in the world with dependent and accepting it. The, the chapter after that deals with Peter Watts' novel, Blindsight. Peter Watts is a Canadian science fiction writer. Blindsight takes place in the late 21st century. It's about two things. One is about post-human enhancements to consciousness, which take extremely baroque and weird forms of ways in which we use technology to enhance our, our conscious experience, to interface ourselves with machines, or to monkey with our biological processes. He then takes these humans and sends them out to meet aliens from another species, from another star system, who turn out who are, in every possible way, superior to us. They have much more powerful technology. They can strategically outthink us at every turn, and so on and so forth. Except it turns out that these aliens are not conscious in any way we recognize what it means to be conscious. And the novel asks, what difference would that make? The final chapter of the book talks about, goes from science fiction to actual science. So uh, the last chapter of the book is about slime molds. Slime molds are these really strange biological organisms. They're like giant amoebas, but basically what happens is when they, when they nuclei break, in, in all multicellular life, you, you have the cell division. The, new, this, the cell divides into two cells. I mean, this happens with things like amoebas and paramecians and monocellular organisms with nuclei. It also happens in all multicellular things. Our tissues develop, we grow, we replace old skin, we replace old other organs by, by the response of splitting. What happens in slime molds is that they, they don't divide into separate cells. So the nucleus divides into two nuclei now with the same DNA, but there's still one cell, the cells don't break apart. And this 
keeps them happening for A16 and so on. So eventually you have these blobs of protoplasm, which are single cells, which is another division, but which, and which is maybe like this big, as you can see with the naked eye, but which again is with the size of millions of nuclei is a single cell. And recent scientific research has been really fascinating about this. It shows that these organisms, despite not having brains, obviously, since they don't have any specialized organs at all, do think. And they've done all kinds of experiments. They can solve mazes, they can respond to stimuli in differentiated ways. They can do all kinds of weird, remarkable things, despite not having brains. So I basically take these scientific reports and read them as reports, but in the same way that I read all the science fiction narratives of future events as reports, as another look into a very non-human, a very different human form of sentience. Okay, so what the book tries to do is to explore these different types of sentience as these science fiction narratives give us insight, in, insight into them. And to elaborate on some of the themes I hinted on the, in the introduction I just read to you, which is about um, about feeling and sentience and not being reduced to either cognition or to consciousness. Um, I actually have a bunch of other thoughts about that, but I'm going to, I'm just going to, in, in time, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to say some very, very brief comments about this, and then I'm going to read the conclusion to this book, which sort of goes off in a different direction. Okay, so. Um, I see the book as having a um, double function because um, so I'm using in this book I'm using science fiction to address these philosophical and scientific issues about sentience and consciousness of thought and so so on and so forth. But in addition to that, I see it as exemplary of a larger method of how science fiction as a particular genre, literary genre, deals with these kinds of speculative questions. Science fiction is called <coughs> speculative fiction, which is usually a term which includes related genres like fantasy and horror. But science fiction or speculative fiction is obviously not philosophical. It doesn't make the kind of arguments that philosophers make. It, it, it does engage, however, in a very order, orderly process of scientific of speculative extrapolation. It makes thought experiments. It embodies these thought experiments in narratives and characters, as, as I mentioned. And, and works these through in different ways. And that's why different scientific fiction narratives do this with different types of questions. My first book to really deal in a, in a big way with science fiction was a book from about 2003 called Connected, or What It Means to Live in the Network Society, where I used science fiction narratives to think about the internet and cyber culture and the ways in which all forms of social life are being changed by, by these technological developments. Um, in my book, my short book about accelerationism, which came out last year, I used some science fiction narratives to think about sort of the consequences of our living in an unending nightmare of neoliberal capitalism and what this means when pushed to the furthest extreme. Um, beyond this, I think the other thing, the argument I want to make, which I still haven't, isn't in this book, which I hope will be in some of my future work, has to do with questions of time, in particular, with the question of how futurity plays out in science fiction. So um, there are many kinds of distinctions. None of them are rigorous distinctions. The, the speculative writer China Mievel suggested that mainstream literary fiction should be called mimetic fiction because it just presents a, a detective of mimesis of what actually exists. But what, one argument for science fiction and other speculative genres is that there's more to reality, well, how do we say it? There's more to reality than actuality. This is I'm taking the language here both from Gilles Deleuze and from Alfred North Whitehead, who both say this in different ways. There, anything actual is real, but reality includes not only the actual here and now, but also things which are embedded in the here and now, things from the past and things from the future. So, I mean, William Faulkner made the famous statement, the past is not even gone, it's not even past, because his traces of things that are happening historically don't disappear, they're still there, they're still haunting us. Um, they still determine what we're doing. A lot of what these things don't, I mean, it's like, it's a common American phrase to say that something's not relevant anymore. You're history. But in fact, history isn't like that. History takes its revenge on us, and we're, we're continually suffering through the, when Marx calls the dead, the horrible dead weight of the past upon the present. The, I can't, it's, a, it's a phrase in 18 from very the, the, the horrific way of the past, I don't remember the exact phrase, but anyway. Um, so 
I think that's fairly clear. I think maybe more difficult to grasp, but also necessary. So think about how, how futurity exists in the present. Futurity exists as potential, as ways things develop, ways things could, could change. That doesn't mean that futurity contains what's going to actually happen. This would not be a deterministic theory that everything is stated to happen in a certain way and that there's no f change or freedom. But any present situation as we live in it contains different potentialities. Things which actually exist could develop in different ways, plausibly, could go in different directions. The real difference, I think, is between the Lewis calls them between potentiality and possibility. Anything, anything that's not a logical contradiction is possible. So there can't be a square circle because that's a logical contradiction. But again, analytic philosophers like to have talk about things which are possible, like Hillary Putnam has a famous article where he talks about what if you had a world that's not like Earth, except that the substance which was water on their world, which exact, acted exactly the same way as water acts for, acts for us, unless it was not H2O but a different chemical composition. And the idea is that asking these kinds of bizarre counterfactuals is a way of thinking what's logically necessary versus what's just contingent to our particular arrangement. The argument against that, which some cognitive philosophers, including Deleuze, have, is that mere logical possibility is a fairly empty concept if it's not, if you don't have sort of a, some plausible kind of how to get from here to there. So, I mean, you know, it's definitely, the, definitely, it's, it's, it's real, Donald Trump is not president right now, but it's definitely a, the potentiality of Donald Trump becoming president and the potentiality of all the things that he do if he were president. I think that's, real, that's not actual because it hasn't happened yet. It won't necessarily happen, but it could happen. We can see a plausible route by which we get from what we have now to that reality. So that is a kind of potentiality. On the other hand, the possibility of Donald Trump suddenly being able to fly and go to the moon without a spacesuit so that's not, there's no logical contradiction involved in that, but I don't think it's a, it's, it's a real potentiality because nobody can really give an account of how it could happen. Okay, so that's sort of that's sort of the difference. So I think what science fiction does is most interesting is dealing with potentiality rather than mere logical possibility. And what that means is, it is if the present is haunted by shards of bits and pieces of the, of the past, um, that we don't have a present which is devoid of the continually influence of things that used to exist but don't anymore. You might say that the present is also wanted by the future. It's wanted by potentialities, which things as they are now contain within them and that they could plausibly go that way, whether or not they actually do. And in that sense, I think the present is wanted by the future as well as by the past. And what I'm trying to get to, partly in this book, which I hope to work more explicitly in later work, is precisely the way in which we can think of Science fiction as a genre which deals with this, not with, science fiction doesn't predict the actual future, but it deals with the futurity which really exists, which is inactual but real in the present. That would be how I define it, and that's my attempt also to, to I mean, I'm, I'm just saying this philosophically, but it engages in an oblique way with the history of science fiction criticism. A lot of science fiction criticism comes out of Darko Subin in the 1970s defined science fiction as having a novo, a kind of new, configuration which would be different from the present and that this, the, co the conceptual possibility of this is what made a work science fictional. Um, Suvin was drawing on the work of the Frankfurt School philosopher Ernst Bloch who tries to see how premonitions of future communism are exist in, in, in everyday reality and capitalist relations. How Block criticizes the whole how all Western philosophy from Plato through Heidegger is all about the past, about unforgetting the past, about going back to the origin, going back before the origin, and stuff like that, of remembrance or unforgetting. Block says we should orient philosophy differently. Philosophy should really be not about the what the immemorial past, it should be about the not yet, something which hasn't happened yet, but which which has premonitions in the present. So Stuart's idea of the novum, which in turn has influenced a lot of science fiction is coming out of Bloch's philosophy. Um, particularly Bloch's 15 amazing, like 1800, how long ago? It's like 800 page long book, of The Principle of Hope. Um, <coughs> more recently, the, the late queer critic, Jose Munoz, used Bloch and, again, potentiality, or this, you know, the not yet our future, as a way to think about queer, queer potentialities in a society which is still homophobic as in order to recover a kind of utopian dimension for 
for queer culture. So I'm sort of drawing on this on them and trying to think about futurity or the not yet, or the shards of futurity or shards of potentiality that actually exist in the present. That that in maybe they don't exist. They if the past if they, if if actual things exist and the past subsists, then maybe you can say using some more of that French philosophical jargon, the future insists. There it's, it's, it doesn't it's not really present, but it's sort of it has a ghostly pre-presence. And science fiction is a way of trying to draw out some of those shards. And this would explain both the utopian and the dystopian propensities of, of science fiction. It's, it's what happens when you take this, this, the um, speculative extrapolation as seriously as it deserves to be taken. Okay, so there's more to that which I won't get into, for, which has to do with, I mean, there's a lot, this also has a lot to do with ways of thinking of temporality. and. Um, I've been reading a lot about it. So, Henri Bergson had a very powerful theory of time, which Gilles Deleuze takes up, especially when he talks about cinema. Um, but Bergson also, the, the problem with Bergson had to do with when Bergson had this famous confrontation with Einstein in 1922, where Einstein, the basis of the his scientific notion of space time, totally invalidated Bergson's philosophical notion of time. And Bergson wasn't really um, objecting to what Einstein said scientifically. He was saying that Einstein that you can accept the scientific results without having to accept the particular metaphysics that Einstein draws from 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 his correct and and, and provable science. And I'm, I'm thinking of this a lot because there was just a book that came out by Jimena Canales, who's a historian of science at I think University of Illinois Urbana Champaign, wrote a just book, just wrote a great book called Philosopher and the Physicist, no, the Physicist and the Philosopher which is about the confrontation between Einstein and Bergson and the intellectual currents surrounding it and both preceding it and following after it. And part of her point is to say that though the official intellectual history is that Einstein and Ben Bergson lost in this due to the irrelevance of the electricity when compared to a real hard scientist, that in fact, Bergson raised valid issues which still resonate today and which deserve thought even as we also accept Einstein's theories, which of course were just validated yet again with the discovery of gravitational waves. Um, so I've been thinking along those lines, and I've been thinking of, Bergson talks about the past as a dimension of reality beside, alongside the present. The past isn't just what used to be present. It has a kind of subsistence alongside the present, which turns into it. And Deleuze picks this up when he talks about film and the way time works in film. And I think, again, there might be a way to work with this stuff in science fiction and think about future, the future as a third Aspect. Deleuze talks about future as most present past and his book Difference of Repetition, but I found, I've never found his stuff of the future very convincing. That may just me, Orthodox Deleuzean, who may mad at me and walk out of this point. But, um, but nonetheless, so I'm trying, I'm trying to think about, so think about these issues about futurity and how they are built philosophically, but again, not as a philosopher, which I am not, but thinking about it through science fiction. Okay, should I keep it there? I mean, I can read one without another. I have another 10 15 minutes if you want to another 10 minutes. Okay, so the last thing I'll do, though, basically discontinuous, is that I'm going to read, what I'm going to read is something, I'm going to read the afterwards of my book. I read the introduction, I skipped all the chapters about science fiction and science and philosophy. Um, but I wrote an afterward, which actually was published separately, in which it's sort of, an, it's self extrapolation. It's not really something of anything I said in the book, it's sort of where I'd like to look next. And it's, it's called 22 Theses of Nature. And uh, some literary journal, some critical journal asked for people like 50 people or 40 people to write things about how we can, what, what it means to think about nature today. And I came up with these 20 theses. And I think they're relevant to what I was saying about science and about science fiction. <coughs> so I'll conclude by just reading those. They're, they're a little, I mean, they're deliberately kind of aphoristic and they're somewhat developed. Okay. One, we can no longer think of nature as one side of a binary opposition. In an age of anthropogenic global warming and genetically modified organisms, not to mention big data and world-encompassing computing and communications networks, it makes no sense to oppose nature to culture or a state of nature to human society or the natural to the artificial. Human beings and their productions are not separate from nature. They are just as much or just as little natural as everything else. Two, we must think of nature without any residual anthropocentrism. That is to say, without accepting ourselves from it, and also without remaking it in our own image. Human beings are part of nature, but nature is not human, and is not centered upon human beings or upon anything human. 
Three, above all, we must avoid thinking that nature is simply given and therefore always the same, as opposed to a social realm that would be historical and constructed. Rather, we must recognize that nature itself is always in movement, in process, and under construction. We need to revive the great 19th century discipline of natural history, practiced by Darwin, Wallace, and many others. Evolution, phylogeny, and development, ontogeny, are both historical processes. They cannot be reduced to the study of genomes as synchronic structures. Four, nature is all-encompassing, but it is not a whole, WHOLE. It is radically open. However far we go in space, we will never find an edge or a boundary. There is no way of adding everything up and coming up with nature as a fixed sum. There is also no way of subordinating nature to some theory of everything. Yes, some physicists have claimed to be looking for. Five, nature is radically open in terms of time as well as space. The future is always contingent and unpredictable. It cannot be reduced to any calculus of probabilities. As John Maynard Keynes and Kenton Mayasu have both shown us in their very different ways, the future is intrinsically unknowable. It exceeds any closed list of possibilities. The radical unknowability of nature is not an epistemological constraint. It is a basic and positive ontological feature of nature itself. Six, in the 19th century, thinkers as different as Schelling and Engels tried to define an overall logic of nature that included that that was not reducible to human developments and concerns. In the 20th century, such projects were abandoned. Instead, humanity was either given a special transcendental status in phenomenology, or else reduced to its non-organic presuppositions, presuppositions in scientism. Today, in the 21st century, both of these alternatives are bankrupt. We need to return to a project of thinking of nature directly, even if we reject the particular antiquated terms of figures like Schelling and Engels used for their own attempts. Seven. Schelling and Engels both tried to conceive of nature in ways that were grounded in, but not reducible to the best natural science of their own times. Our task today is similarly to conceive of nature in ways that are grounded in, but not reducible to the best contemporary science. Eight. Nature is neither a plenum nor a void. Rather, conditions or states of affairs within nature may tend either towards plenitude or towards vacancy. Usually, though, neither of these tendential extremes is reached. Things generally fluctuate in an intermediate range between fullness and emptiness. Nine. However, we are still on safer ground if we consider that nature comprises something rather than nothing. We know from modern physics that quantum fluctuations happen even in a vacuum. In this sense, nature is better understood in terms of more rather than less, or surplus rather than, def rather than deficiency. Nature will never be finished, never be shaped and structured once and for all, but it has also never been without form and void. 10. Nature is not formless and not simply homogeneous. It is rather metastable, in the sense defined by the French philosopher Gilbert Simondon. All-encompassing nature is traversed by potentials and powers or by energy gradients and internal <laughs> tendencies. At any moment, these may be activated and actualized. The most minute imbalance of most fleeting encounter can be enough to set things into motion. And there is generally more to the effect than there is to the cause. The consequences of these imbalances and encounters tend to be orders of magnitude larger than the incidents that set them into motion. 11. The result of any disruption of nature's metastability is what Simonon calls individuation the emergence and structuration of an individual together with those in its associated milieu. Examples of this process include the precipitation of a crystal out of a solution and the emergence and growth of distinct tissues, organs, and parts from an initially undifferentiated embryo. 12. Nature thus comprises multiple processes of individuation. These must all be understood in two distinct ways, in terms of energetics and in terms of informatics. 13. Nature involves continual flows of energy. Energy, or more precisely mass energy, can never be created or destroyed, but only transformed from one state to another, <coughs> which is the first law of thermodynamics. And yet this also means that energy is continually being expended or dissipated as gradients are reduced and entropy is maximized, which is the second law of thermodynamics. As the biologist Eric Schneider argues, complex organized systems, from hurricanes to living organisms, tend to form because they can dissipate energy more efficiently and on a vaster scale than what otherwise be possible. Such dissipative systems are internally negentropic or orderly, but this is exactly what allows them to discharge so much energy into their environments, thus increasing entropy and reducing energy gradients overall. 14. Today, thanks to our computing technologies, we tend to think more commonly of in informational terms than in energetic ones. 
Physicists propose that the universe is ultimately composed of information. Cognitive scientists tend to see biological organisms as information processing systems. I fear that our excessive concern with informatics has gotten in the way of a proper understanding of the importance of energetics. 15. Information, unlike energy, has no in itself. For information will exist insofar as it's for some entity, someone or something, that parses it in some way. This might make it seem as if information were inessential. But nothing is altogether devoid of information. For nothing exists altogether on its own, outside of all encompassing nature, entirely self-subsistent, and without ever being affected by anything else. The transmission and parsing of information, no less than the transfer and dissipation of energy, is an essential process of nature. 16. We might link information to perception on the one hand and to action on the other. Perception is how we obtain bits of information, and the parsing or processing of information issues forth in the possibility of action. A living organism gathers information by perceiving its environment, and it uses this information in order to respond flexibly and appropriately to whatever conditions it encounters. This is not just the case for animals or entities with brains. A tree discerns water in the soil which it draws in with its roots, it discovers insects fitting on its leaves, and releases a noxious chemical to repel them. Information processing thus mediates between perception and action. 17. Information processing involves, and indeed requires, at least a minimal degree of sentience. But we should not confuse sentience with consciousness, for the former is a far broader category than the latter. Organisms like trees, bacteria, and slime molds are probably not conscious, but they are demonstrably sentient as they process information and respond to it in ways that are not stereotypically determined in advance. Even when it comes to ourselves, most of the information processing in our brains goes on unconsciously and without any possibility of ever becoming conscious. Most likely, consciousness is only sparsely present in nature, but sentience is far more widely distributed. 18. Perception is only a particular sort of causality when I perceive something, this means that the thing in question has affected me in some way, whether through light, sound, touch, or some other medium. But if I'm affected by something, then something has had an effect upon me. So I'm playing an affect, A-F-F-E-C-T, an effect, E-F-F-E-C-T. It has altered me, however minimally, in some manner or other. And this process cannot be confined to thus just to perception. I'm often affected by things without overtly perceiving them. I feel the symptoms of a cold, but I do not sense the virus that actually causes me to fall ill. I feel an impulse to buy something, because my mind has been subliminally primed in some way. I lose my balance and fall from a height, pulled by the Earth's gravitational field even before becoming aware of it. I turn over in my sleep, responding to some change in the ambient temperature. In all these cases, something has caused a change in me, has given rise to an effect. Information has been processed in some manner by my body, if not my mind. 19. Nature involves a continuum of causes producing effects, which in turn become the causes of further effects, ad infinitum. This need not imply linearity or mode of causality. There are many causes for every effect, and many effects arising from every cause. And potential causes may interfere with and block one another. But just as energy is continually being transformed, so information is continually being processed, even on what we might consider a purely physical level. This is why information, no less than energy, is a basic category of nature. 20. Within the all-encompassing nature, the difference between the physical and the mental is only a matter of degree and not of kind. A thermostat is to a logic's extent an information processor, and therefore we should agree that it is at least minimally sentient, if not as the philosopher David Chalmers, David Chalmers suggests, actually conscious. That is to say, the thermostat feels, although it does not know anything and is not capable of self-reflection. We can make a similar claim for a stone that falls off a cliff, or even for one that lies motionless on the ground. Gravity pulls the stone to the earth, and the information associated with this process is what the stone feels. 21. Nature is not itself a particular thing or a particular process, although it is the never completed sum, as well as the framework of all the multitudinous things and processes, transformations of energy and accumulations of information that take place within it. How finally can we characterize it? All encompassing nature stands apart from every particular instant, instance, and yet it is not anything like a Kantian transcendental condition of possibility for these instances, since it stands on the same level, within the same imminent plane as that. Nature is neither outside history, nor the totality of history, nor a particular data of natural or social history. It is rather what all these particular instances, all these transformations and accumulations have in common. It is what places them all in a common world. 22. I will conclude by taking a hint from Alfred North Whitehead, who articulates this commonness more rigorously than I can. Whitehead translates the ancient Greek word physis, not just as nature, which is the customary translation, but also as process and equates this thesis with a narrower technical term from Plato's Timaeus, hypodokeia, 
the receptacle. Nature or the receptacle, Whitehead says, and this is the rest of it is a quote from Whitehead. Nature imposes a common relation about all that happens, but doesn't impose what that relation shall be. It may be conceived as a necessary community within which this course of history is set in abstraction from all particular historical facts. That's it. Thank you. You said that at the end, you didn't quite get there, but you're also going to talk about how, in fact, what you had to say about science fiction might apply to literature in general or imaginative practices in general. And while you were talking, I did, in fact, feel that was the case. I mean, I was trying to think of what might be the opposite of science fiction, so I was thinking realism. And I was going back to, let's say, the most traditional realism is Balzac, where you get like a talking donkey skin or something. I mean, pretty weird stuff happens, even in traditional. Uh, uh, realism. Yeah. So why, why the attachment to science fiction and do you feel that the particular work you're doing with science fiction could just as well happen in a study of realist work, for example? I think to characterize contemporary literature just mimetic is rather, you know, as Miel uh, did this kind of narrow minded. And then the second thing I wanted to add to that was about the title of the book, so yeah. Discognition. That's another concept. It seems to me that you're putting out there. I like the this, of course, that's added to it because it suggests that what you're doing, the operation you're performing as a philosopher, is a kind of un unworking a désavouement, not how to put it, of the idea of, of cognition. And so there, I can see, you know, sort of tension beginning to emerge, where part of the practice or the project here appears to be on the side of that unworking, and then there's sort of a more I don't know how to call it, maybe utopian goal of bringing out that difference between one shade of red and the other shade of red that's not really conceptualizable, but that appears at the limit of this cognition, yeah. and that's maybe not really writable mm -hmm. in strictly philosophical terms. And so do you struggle with that when you're philosophizing, when you're writing? Is there something in the writing that you're practicing as a philosopher that seeks to bring that out, tease that out, you know, make that appear, so to speak, in the text? Okay, thanks. I'll try to answer both of those. The first one, I'd say, yeah, sure, I think this applies to what we generally call the arts more generally. Um, when I mentioned Charlie Naval talking about mimetic fiction, he was really just speaking as if somebody who writes often with the most considered genre about how people in genre are kind of annoyed when they're told that's not real literature. So really, what, he, what he's really trying to say is just that, you know, all, any kind of literature is real literature and that, you know, it's we should think that, and in fact, everything's a genre. I also mentioned those Sam and Lane's from with power literature, where he suggests that kinds of disreputable, not quite literature, like science fiction, pornography, might precisely because they aren't in the canons of you know taste and aesthetic greatness, might be able to explore things which more other works wouldn't. But I'd say, in principle, I'm making an argument about art or about aesthetics, so I think that all you know. Any form of artistic activity could potentially be doing the kind of stuff you're talking about. I'm particularly interested in science fiction. I mean, partly for biographical reasons. It's I, I, I've read it since I was 12 years old, and I really enjoyed reading it. But I, but intellectually, I think it's just because it's addressing these certain some of these issues in particular ways because of how it relates to the genre, because it's about technology, because it's about futurity, and, and so on and so forth. Again, I'm very you know. None of these things have firm outlines, and they're always ambiguous cases of cases which don't, which, which don't work. So you know, so so I cheerfully say, yeah, any kind of literature and other kinds of, I don't know. Again, in my own work, I seem to concentrate on the one hand, um, interest. I, I, I work on science fiction. The other hand, I work on film, and, and as a film scholar, I mostly talk about contemporary films, which are doing interesting things with new digital technologies, and especially I've been working recently with music videos, which often do very interesting cultural things, but also interesting things with new digital technologies. And it's kind of a joke, this is too reductive, but one way to describe what I do is that I 
go to science fiction literature for its content and you go to music videos for their form. I mean, it's a joke because you can't really separate the two because it's some of each and both, but you know. Okay, so I hope that answers the first question. For the second question, um, what was that? I'm sorry. I'm losing track here. Just very briefly, the second question was about. No. Wait, it was about the notion of discognition. Okay, yeah. some other concept out there. And are you trying to unwork cognition? Or are well, you I mean, both. I mean, you know, it's, I, I, you know, I, at the end of the day, I admit it's maybe a kind of, I went to the fleshy title and said, like, it's kind of a cheap trick which worked. You know, I mean, it's sort of like, it goes back to deconstruction. Um, despite what, you know, some people thought, Derrida always said that the reason he said deconstruction because it was both. It was a construction and it was not the destroying and construction, it was a construction and destruction operate together, they each applies the other, the two are intimately inter intertwined and, and, and tangled up with each other. So I'm sort of making polemically um, saying that I disagree with the way the privileging of cognition in contemporary philosophy of mind and, and in contemporary neurobiology and stuff like that. And um, I think <coughs> we need to think about things which exceed, which basically exceed the boundary of the cognitive, except I like reverse it, like to say, which are pre-cognitive as well as post-cognitive. So things which are beneath or beyond certain thresholds, which therefore cannot be cognized or conceptualized, but nonetheless which drive both energetically and informatically what we do cognize. I mean, it's not a kind of cliche romanticism that we should only feel, not think, but it's trying to understand how thinking involves feeling and how I mean, I'm, I'm mostly reacting against the kind of, again, I've been doing a lot of work in speculative realism, and I'm mostly reacting against the, the version of speculative realism represented by Ray Brassier, who's going to be at this thing later. And Ray Brassier, I mean, I, you should all go to hear him. He's, I'm, I'm blown away by his brilliance, even though I fundamentally disagree with what he's saying. Um, he's a really brilliant thinker, and he's trying to talk about how um, a scientific worldview, both has ways of establishing itself which radically differentiate itself from all the forms of sensation, sentience, and so on and so forth. It also leads to these radically nihilistic conclusions, such as that you know, all narratives are meaningless and so on and so forth. So um, I'm resisting that, but I take it seriously enough that I don't want to just you know, go to what could easily be denounced as a sappy humanism of all these internal verities, which are really true after all. I'm not sure, I'm not sure that's, I can really believe that either. But, um, I'm trying, so I'm trying to make up, I did a kind of cheap trick of making up a word which would be cute, which would imply the conditions there, but it's something which is irreducible to it also. And I want to say both of things that we can't cognize, and yet that these things we can't cognize are necessary to cognition arising subsequently. And I'm identifying this non-cognitive with aesthetics, which I do through my particular way of misreading Kant's critique, which I've written about elsewhere, which you can go to if you want, but if you don't have to. Other questions? Uh, I, I'll start it out. Oh, my question is about, uh, I've been thinking a lot about uh, feelings being in the body and thoughts being in the mind. Yeah. And you were talking about sentience in the body. And I thought that was kind of beautiful. Well, thank you. Um, again, you know, there are real problems I mean, these are things which nobody is able to figure out. And part of my justification for, uh, as I said, I'm not a philosopher, really. My background is in English literature, actually, though I, the only academic work today is as a film scholar. But, um, you know, there, there's, there, there's a, lot of, a lot of trouble about Nobody wants to be a dualist and say that mind and body are separate. So they have to be the same. But nobody, but again, you know, there's a question of how you do that. It's, it, it leads to logical tangles no matter what position you take. And I mean, positions which contemporary philosophers take range from range from sentience is so self-evident that it, that that it obviously exists, and that um, um, to sort of saying that it's a complete delusion. And I mean, you know, it's. It's, it's, hard, it's, it's, it's hard to know, to, hard to see how you negotiate and negotiate. And these are philosophers who are constantly replying to each other's essays and arguing in, in public and so on and so forth. So I'm hoping that thinking about these in, in science fiction terms gives a, a different kind of dimension to do this. Because you want to say, 
So I just, yeah, do you want to say thought is mental, but you also want to say it's bodily because you don't want to really separate the mind from the body because we don't want to be Cartesian duels who think the mind is something absolutely you know, distinct from, from the body and we simply have feelings and experiences emotionally which involve our body. You know, I mean, it's, it, it's really an impossible tangle and I'm suggesting two things. I'm, one is I'm suggesting that thing, fiction or forms of aesthetics or art are ways of dealing with these things which get you tangled if you try to be, when you try to be strictly logical and conceptual about them. And the second thing I'm trying to suggest is that there's a certain, um, in a certain way I'm privileging aesthetics. I mean, Graham Harmon, the secular realist philosopher Graham Harmon says somewhere, aesthetics is first philosophy. And I sort of agree with him though for different reasons because I define it in a very different way than he does. But um, aesthetics, I mean, has to do with singularity. And I mean, there's all kinds of things in Kant and from the tradition, both before and after, kind of the present about aesthetic judgment and how we know and really know whether it's being viewed as subjective or whatever. But aesthetics are sort of things which aren't generalizable, really. And that's, they're not conceptualizable because they're not generalizable. There's a particular, and whether it's a very simple sensation like this particular shade of, of red, which is different from a slight, from a slight different shade of red, which, as I said, shows scientists of how we can distinguish even though we can't remember or conceptualize the distinction. Or whether it's much more complicated things in that, you know, everything's multiply overdetermined. That means that ultimately no one situation can be transferred to any of the situation because they have differences between them. So I'm, I'm suggesting one way of thinking about aesthetics is as art is what deals with this realm where the distinctions fail either because things are too singular or too convoluted. I don't know if that answers your question, but I, I'm thinking about the question of the mind and body and consciousness and non-conscious thought also. But it's a way of trying to mix everything up, but also not say everything's just the same, if that makes any sense. Hi, Hi thanks very much for your talk. I, I think maybe what I'm going to try and do is possibly ask for a clarification okay. rather than ask a question necessarily. But, okay. Um, I guess because I was, of course, very interested in your account of science as having this, this fictive element, um, fict, science fic, science fiction, yeah. you know, this kind of cross relation between these um, methods and in the sense that we could talk about heuristics, mm -hmm. abduction, nodal vocabularies, yeah. and so on in all these different kind of forms of thought and action. And um, I was kind of thinking about that um, in terms of how what you described on the one hand I could perceive as a kind of naturalism, and then on another hand, I was thinking about the potential nominalism that's involved, mm -hmm. in the sense that I was imagining how good, let's say, good science fiction, um, rather than China's version of this minutic claim, yeah. you know, that distinction that we mm -hmm. were making um, here, how, how, let's say, this, this good science fiction, or correct science fiction, um, manages to like its destination i'm thinking about it in your opinion would yeah. you say that its destination is to ultimately expand consciousness as it comes back into mind so that's my first kind of question because um whilst its method involves let's say heuristics or yeah. no look at the resource or other forms of abductive reasoning we can think of it, is it a kind of um, naturalized method um, that, that in its destination has, in your opinion, a, a, a kind of politics, perhaps, or uh, in, in terms, and, and is that politics framed in terms of um, allowing us to reformulate um, what consciousness is, but is that by means of, let's say, traditional forms of cognition? And therefore, I, I was wondering about this, um, necessary, I think, distinction between the minutic sci-fi and the, let's say, the good sci-fi, for want of a better word, and whether um, that um, need to, the requirement to make the distinction in the first place, while both are expressions of forms of sentience, absolutely, mm -hmm. but, but there are, it seems that we have a hierarchy here um, that actually invites a form of um, metaphysics or let's say a, a, a nominalism uh, that can make that distinction and is that distinction itself made through um, let's say standard forms of analytical cognition so I'm asking I guess about the pre and the post um, that comes 
um, perhaps frames the speculative method. So I, I guess I wonder if you could clarify how you see the process here. That's what I'm asking. Thanks. Okay, well, again, I'm obviously speaking in very general terms, and you always have to draw distinctions when you look at individual cases. So I'm not sure I completely, but I can completely respond to what you're saying. But I mean, I think, again, there's, there are various, I mean, both scientists and fiction writers, let's say, um, make hypotheses and see the consequences and test the consequences in various ways. And um, against maybe the argument that science is a very unique method, which has only emerged recently in human history and it's different from anything else that's happened on this planet, because science is self-correcting and we're not going to tell ourselves stories, but we have ways in which we're forced to change our opinions, so on and so forth, which is the rationalistic account of science. I mean, I'm inclined to say more that science is that there's a general continuity through all these different activities in human life. There are forms of reality testing and of speculating under rules. I mean, it, and, and relate that to what other organisms already do also in their own ways. I'm not sure if that's answering what you're, what, what you're saying. Um, I'm not sure I'm getting quite the focus of what you were asking on. Well, I was kind of wondering if, whilst the method you're describing in a kind of form of naturalism, naturalism yeah. let's say, um, actually requires quite standard forms of analytical understandings of, of human um, self-conception, um, oh. both in terms of understanding the rule, the rule of speculation, let's say, the rule that governs sort of speculation itself, um, or the understanding of the affect of um, a possible expanded consciousness that these science fiction methods produce. Yeah. I'm not sure, well, I'm not sure that it necessarily means expanded consciousness. I mean, I think, I, 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 I tend to try to, to resist ideas that we have these norms which we have to follow. I mean, I think it's more a question of seeing, of, you know, seeing certain things work and certain things don't work. You get stuck, and if you get stuck, you have to go back and go in a different direction. And I think science is a particular, very brilliant and powerful and important formalization of that, but I don't think it brings us into another space where we have rational norms which tell us how to do things. Is that, I'm not sure if that's answering well, either. Not, I'm well, sorry, I'm, 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 I'm missing yeah, something here. Yeah, I was thinking, here. that you know, we get stuck uh, because we're trying to do what? I'm thinking about the board. Right? Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know. I'm, I mean, you're talking about politics or you're talking about, I mean, I don't know. It's, I think a lot, I mean, whether we should do this, I don't know. Um, you know, we probably shouldn't do anything just because it's scientifically possible. That'll probably, you know, end up as our destroying ourselves completely. You know, so <coughs> I tend to be suspicious, say, oh, if you can do it, then then, then we should. It's very important to put the genie back in the bottle, so we you know with things like nuclear power and and, and other and genetic modif modifications of other technologies like that. I think speculation is a way of trying to try possible before you actually commit to them. I mean, that's part of my argument about how this is aesthetic and about how, you know, I don't want the nice lily maniac to kill me, but I do like to watch horror films in which nice lily maniac kill people. You know, I mean, it's trying out possibilities without having to be committed to them yet. And that's, that's a fictional mode. I guess I was reading your version of speculative fiction as a commitment. I mean, I don't want to say, I mean, I'm saying specific things about science fiction and speculative fiction because I think, I find them useful in focusing on the particular genre I'm interested in. I don't want to make a realistic claim that this is the master genre which everything else has to be subordinated to. I mean, it's more a case, you know, nobody can be interested, can follow everything. I mean, I don't know. What I think the most important thing in intellectual terms today is there's such a tendency to try to reduce all forms of research and learning to what can you do a better job or what your income's going to be afterwards. And I think that's what has to be absolutely resisted. I don't think if somebody's, you know, studying the mating habits of sea slugs or the conjugations of Latin verbs, I think those are worthy as students are adding the human knowledge. And we should say here these are worthwhile for you know general motors, so therefore we should ask the budget for those. And, you know? I don't know if that's answering all of this when I'm I'm sorry.
Um, maybe um, this question is uh, asking you to give away the ending of the book, but um, I'm wondering if a certain ethic emerges after all these readings of uh, science fiction, but then in the final chapter, there's the what's treated are scientific reports and uh, encounters with uh, really existing being where sentience is postulated. Yeah. And so in the reading of the reports, is there a lesson that's learned from reading science fiction or uh, how science fiction is, or speculative fiction is, is playing out in uh, imaginary encounters with other beings? So does, does a certain ethic emerge that you find yourself adopting or find yourself adopting in that final chapter? Mm -hmm. Not really. I mean, I think I think with the different chapters in this book is sort of different alternatives rather than having progression. In the sense that we're seeing, I mean, sentience or consciousness or whatever can take many more forms than we, and many weirder forms than, than we think. Um, and we can imagine, I mean, it's always a problem. How do you imagine something which is outside of our experience? I mean, it's, it's kind of oxymoronic, and yet we do it, or we try to do it with certain, with different degrees of success. So, I mean, I think you can find these in actual, in the actual natural or physical world, but you can also, you know, find in these thought experiments which are fictions. And I don't think, I'm trying to level them with each other. I mean, this is something I've often done in science fiction in the past, also is that um, in my book, Connected, or what I mean, so the Network Society, I, I was talking about this one science fiction novel, Noir by K.W. Jeter. And, you know, it was basically a one page of take, you know, reports, news reports of what's happening on the internet in 2003 when I wrote the book. And the next page I take what happens in a chapter of this novel, and I give them the same sort of, sort of ontological status. These are both things that, weird things that are happening that are worth commenting on. But I didn't, I didn't want to put, you know, a hierarchy between them. But I think they're always, I, I think they're multiple sources. There's no one, you know, it's, it's kind of like, John, the philosopher John Francois Leopard wrote in the 80s in his book Post on Condition that we had 20th century grand narratives, and these grand narratives have now collapsed. But, um, and in a way that's problematic because one of the grand narratives was a narrative of liberation and emancipation at that class, and we're just kind of stuck in the shit, which is, seems to be our present condition actually. But um, the, uh, the other side is that, is that when we don't have the grand narratives, everything has to fit into it, lots of little narratives, and some of them are useful or interesting or pleasurable or helpful or, or whatever. And so if you take this as we can't have a grand narrative today, it's not going to work because of social and economic conditions, then let's see what other narrative we can find which can push in certain directions, which can do things with it, which can help us in some ways. That's really what I'm saying, I think. I don't know if that quite answers your question, but that's um, so my question is sort of directed at if you're interested in the music videos. Yeah. Um, and I apologize to people who haven't read this book. For our class, we read uh, the Grace Jones uh, essay. We talk about um, her music video and, and the, the possibility of digital video achieving an experience different than film in, in sort of transcriptive uh, linear experience of film. You also talk about her lyrics and these sort of post-capitalist um, ideas that she's bringing, bringing up. You also talk about um, her in the context of Afrofuturism. And so kind of continuing this idea of speculative fiction, I couldn't help but thinking in watching this music video how the music as this inherently time-based form was impacting the way that I was experiencing time and the ideas that you're bringing up. And so my question is, um, how, how do you see instrumental music, um, not you know, divorced from, from words, um, as potentially speculative? Or put differently, how do you experience instrumental music in this way that you experience Science fiction. Um, I'd like to say yes. I again, you know, I think it's always the most interesting place to be moving between areas of interest. But I have very little musical training, and so I always feel that I'm not getting things right when I talk about music. But I think music is obviously an art which is totally temporal. You can't have 
in film studies, we often have, you know, we overemphasize, it's, it's really only been in the last 10 or 20 years that sound studies has gotten to be an important part of film studies because, you know, lots of people, lots of people including great critics, talk about film and also about what you see and never about what you hear. And obviously, that's, that's, not, that's not adequate. So I think that I'm, I'm interested in both music and audiovisual media as, as time-bound things. They don't exist. They, they don't just exist synchronously. You may have a score or something like that synchronously, but, but you know, it takes time to go through it. And the experience of, I mean, it, it, there's a whole philosophical question which I'm very interested in about the whole, about how you think about time. And this goes back to what I was mentioning before, the book by Human and Canalis about Bergson and Einstein. Bergson wants to claim there's an existential reality or even an ontological reality of time beyond the physic, physicist notion of space-time. And the question is how you, how you talk about that, and you can think of that in terms of music, because music um, deals with time in very many different ways. We think of whole questions of rhythms and beats and things like that, and multiple rhythms, and music which tries to be pulseless, and, and there's all kinds of different things that music is, is doing with the experience of time. And Bergson compared dur duration, which is basically running to melody, but later thinkers have to maybe we should think of it more in terms of rhythm than in terms of melody, because rhythm is multiple and discontinuous, and yet it, it has a temporal dimension so you can't isolate it an instant. I don't know if that answers you, but it seems to be the connections between of, of temporality, and that has may have to do with the way that I think. I mean, I think that, that, that I think music does do things like this. I'm giving a vague answer because I don't feel my musical knowledge or abilities are up to where I wish they were. But, <laughs> I mean, as I think, film, you know, a lot of, if the last, Beyonce came with this video a few weeks ago and there were like hundreds of articles online, I read most of them, or many of them, and they're all talking about the imagery and about what message Beyonce is giving and how this fits in with, with African-American culture and politics and things like that. But almost nobody talked about the formal way that how the video worked formalistically, which is actually quite interesting. And which both has to do with how the images are related to the sound and how the images have a certain rhetoric of their own in terms of how they're arranged. So it's always easier to talk about the content, which is what I'm doing with the science fiction narratives. I always like to talk about these formal disruptions as being, which, which happen in both images and sounds, and, and which happen in other things. I mean, I'm just trying to take what I can feel I can relate to, so I'm talking about audio visual, certain audiovisual media, rather than say install, video installation art or sculpture or other things, just because I don't feel I relate to them. That's the personal thing, what do I relate to more? What do I feel like I can really communicate with more and get more out of? But I don't get that all these things are relevant. Um, I have a question. Uh, yeah. I'm interested in the undefined space of queerness or at least ideas about becoming or separating myself from identity and politics and um, and about ideas ideas about multiple temporalities as opposed to a chronological understanding of historicism and so I wanted to ask you um, after listening to you I'm wondering if when you conceptualize the speculative uh, or speculative realism as trying different possibilities on before we commit to them. If you are um, saying that there's a moment when we commit to them and we take on identity, traditional identitarian politics, or when you speak about historical understandings of chronological time, or, or when you separate form and content, if, you, if there's a way in which that could also lead to the reinstitutionalization of Western thought and reason. Yeah, well, I think all those risks are there. I mean, I don't think there's any, I mean, you know, we're not going to get rid of it in the politics as long as we have racism and sexism. And, you know, as long as they're as massive as they are now, we can't just say, oh, we're beyond it. You know, and I think identity, I mean, we talk idealistically about processes of identities congealing, but then also shaping up and having different shapes. But obviously, in you know, racist, sexist, and capitalist society, that's not something which just anybody can do in the same way. So I'm not sure. I, I see some of these aesthetic possibilities as ways of escaping or getting away from these political categories, but I don't, I think, but I'm not, you know, trying to say, la-di-da, the problem's been solved, you know, 
it's unmade. Is that is that answering what you're well, saying? Well, I guess I guess what I'm trying to say is that I I don't I'm not convinced that I need a speculative world in order to try on a, a different gender. I can construct a different gender on my body if I want to right now in this world. So I'm I'm trying to understand it when you're saying when you were answering Amanda's question. If you were saying that you're trying different, that you see speculative realism as trying different possibilities on before you commit to them, that you still believe in committing to something in the end, you still believe in defining our identity in the end, or, or, or did I misunderstand that? That's what I try to understand. Okay, um, I don't think you'll avoid it in the sense that, you know, you, given you know, actual historical, and social, and political, and economic constraints, you can't. Avoid. It's not that I say that I necessarily what I want to, but it's easy. You know, um, we don't have any. What the, we don't have the infamous equal playing field, which certain types of liberals like to talk about. We have a very you know uneven social situation, and it's 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 a it's a, it's a luxury. I mean, it's like you know, Kant says something about you know. A, a starving person doesn't care about the aesthetics of food. If you're well fed and you know in good economic circumstances, then you can be an epicure and you can you know go to different restaurants and taste everything and really get an extreme you know aesthetic enjoyment about food, and that's a really good thing. But somebody starving, they're not going to be thinking about that because they have to you know survive first. And I think that's true about identity politics and stuff like that. I mean, I don't think you know. It's easy for a heterosexual white male like myself to be kind of blasé about these things, but not everybody's in my position. And so I try to just, I, the only answer to that I have is to try to listen to as many different voices as possible. One, I mean, this is something which comes up in science fiction in particular because there's been a lot more writing by women, by people of color, by people from other cultures than, than the US and Western Europe. And there's been a lot of resistance to this, you know, from you know cis head white dudes who you know feel that their their view of the universe is being questioned if anything else exists basically. So the only thing you can do in that instance is try to you know have as much multiplicity as possible. In specific terms, both in the music and the some of the music videos that work on and also in science fiction, I point specifically to Afrofuturism as a way of Afrofuturism seeing science fiction as a central part of the Afro-Diasporic condition, in the, both in terms of in the future and past. In the past, because in effect, what is what is the middle passage in slavery? But it's a kind of bizarre alien invasion where aliens who are you know kidnap people and torture them and they all kinds of hideous things to them and put them in our hellish reality. And that's sort of the beginnings of our modern capitalism, but that's the open unacknowledged beginning. But that's kind of a science, weird science. People taken out of their whole life world and thrust into this horrible alien world where they're tormented. I mean, and on the other hand, fictions of going to the stars or of technological transformation works as a way of trying to get out of hegemonic every current contemporary realities. So Afrofuturism, both in music and in science fiction literature, is very much concerned with those two dimensions. And again, it's, it's I'm not even sure the question of identity politics is relevant is relevant anymore because they're taking experiences which are not recognized as hetero as as normative or mainstream experiences and singularizing them and pushing them in new directions. I, I don't know again, I'm not sure. I'm sorry, if like everybody's question, I'm not sure I'm really answering it, but you know, there's always a negotiation between one's own obsessions and one's trying to you know open up to other perspectives. So I'm, I'm trying to do that. That's okay. Well, I guess I'll jump in with the question then. And uh, I think we have a few more minutes. Uh, uh, you know, what uh, Jordan was talking about, this essay that some of you are certainly familiar with about Grace Jones and corporate cannibalism. If you haven't seen the video, I wouldn't recommend it. It's quite stunning. Uh, but there were some things that you said in there about uh, the notion of transgression that uh, the 20th century was really characterized in many ways by the art of transgression and in some ways because of the strength of capitalism that it's become the transgressor of more or less Trump, sorry, these other elements. 
and that uh, uh, and that in some ways there was kind of, uh, this uh, video pushed Afrofuturism towards a cul-de-sac. Okay, and in that it was really hard to see uh, how you get out of capitalism, which becomes the greatest negativity that we've seen to this point. So I'm just wondering if you can talk a bit about the notion of transgression, the notion of Afrofuturism past, post of this video, and how you see it now. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, this is different stuff I was talking about in in my book, in the book, this book, but I'm happy to talk about it. Um, okay. One of my overall theses, which we have for years about art in the 21st century, is that again it has to do with it. Transgression was a major motif of very a lot of 20th century art. Sometimes sexual transgressions and there's other forms of transgression. Sometimes transgression becomes transcendence. But basically, you know, the, the most important aesthetic gesture was violating the norm, transgressing the law, going, stepping beyond where you're not supposed to go and stuff like that. And I think, I, I like a lot of this art. I mean, if you think of some of the great French writers like Bataille and Artaud and Genet, some of, some of my favorite writers, and I think you can see this being played in like visual arts with Dadaism, and surrealism and, and, and various other movements and you know in, in all different kinds of arts. I think however that you have to see this trans the movement transgression has to be historicized in a certain way. And what's happened in the 21st century is that it doesn't work anymore. Why? Because no matter what kind of weird or odd or unconventional or even nasty this sort of position you take, you can monetize it on the internet basically. Um, it's like there's, you know, it's it's like nothing. The way neoliberal capitalism works today, it can sort of absorb everything. You know, race it, well, that's fine. And there is, that's also fine. We can, you can always have your little niche, niche market to everybody. And everything that used to be a transgression used to be violating the rules, and therefore really shaking up the system is in fact very easily accommodated within the system, and becomes a, a new source of revenue, a new source of you know self capitalization, and so on and so forth. So what I think artists are starting to do is try to think about different strategies. And I don't have an answer as to what the strategy of the 21st century is. But, um, but it was, this would include things about moving towards kind of boredom and undifferentiation as just an attempt to avoid being marketed or categorized. It might include doing something that's so off the wall that it doesn't mean it's transgressive because you can't read it all. I don't, I don't really know. I mean, I just sense that there's something, the whole gesture of look how transgressive it is, become very tired. It doesn't really have a, a radical force. It's, a, it's even the reverse. It's sort of like, you know, in American politics today, you know, Trump's the id and Bernie Sanders is the super ego. And I'm, you know, a Sanders supporter, but it's sort of like, I'm sad that he's not the id. And that, you know, the way to be outrageous and transgressive today is to be, you know, a white, a, a white supremacist, heterosexist, you know, whatever, because because that's because then those people get great gratification. Say, I'm saying something that's particular, that's not politically correct, and therefore I'm being transgressive. But that's what's happened. Transgressive transgression is turned into something which shores up the social order rather than threatens it in any sort of way. So obviously we need to find other ways out. And I'm not sure how that relates to Afrofuturism, but Afrofuturism seems to me it's something I want to write. I've only written about a little. I want to write a lot more about it. Um, again, it's just it's just sort of Afrofuturism. Are people familiar? I mean, Afrofuturism is a term which only was started to use in the 1990s, but it refers to a practice which is much older. So, in in American music or in Afrodite's pop music, where generally you can see Afrofuturism, especially in Sun Ra, where I mean, he basically says he comes from Saturn. He's negating the reality of, of this world because this is a racist reality where black people have no place and he's finding, he's going to outer space where freedom can, can take place. He's taking all these science fiction themed spaceships, going to the speed of light, all this, all this kind of stuff, and recoding black liberation in, in those terms. So when I started in Chicago, it fell into Chicago in the 40s, the same time as the Nation of Islam and more Science Temple and other and other such groups in African American culture were also taking off with somewhat similar mythologies. Um, so it's using both myth and they often combine myth and science, using both mythological structures of speculation and scientific speculation of 
possibilities of transformation as, as methods of changing social reality with a specific focus on the Aphrodite's work experience. That's basically, I, I'm not sure, so I'm not, I wouldn't call that, I wouldn't call someone transgressive. I mean, he, I mean, he's, he goes somewhere else, basically. And you can see, you, you can see, well, what you can see in Samurai, you can see he goes through a lot of history of American music later in the 20th century when you go through, you go through um, groups like from the fucking delicate earth when the fire in the 1970s, when you see the science fiction motifs that would sometimes show up in, in, in hip hop. Um, so besides present music, it's very much present in science fiction, since one of the things that's happening is more and more interesting and powerful science fiction is being written by women and by people of color, and a lot of it deals explicitly with these, these kinds of themes. And it's still the same issues. I, Nenei Okorofor is one of the most interesting science fiction writers at the moment. Um, for instance, she, one of her recent novels is called Lagoon. It's a, it's a narrative of aliens coming to the Earth for the first time, but they don't come to London or New York, they come to Lagos, Nigeria instead. And she just says, here's an alternate speed, here's a traditional science fiction trope, but they're being very alternate spin it by having, they, they, they don't care about Western civilization, they care about something else. And she sort of she said on Facebook that she's got the most bizarre responses to this from people who read the book, but can't conceive that Lagos would be more important than New York or London. You know, I mean, so there's a lot of resistance to this still in among certain audiences. But I'm 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 becoming more and more vague as I feel like I'm slowing down. Well, so it's you. almost time, unless anybody has another question. I think uh, Lagos and Sun Ra <coughs> are a good place to end. So. Uh, one more quick shout out to um, uh, John D'Amico, who made this, he's not here, I'm front, unfortunately he's left, but he's made this space available to us, so we're grateful for sure. But to uh, Stephen Shavero for his presentation. Thank you.